Let's see. All right, this is it. We're kicking off. I thought I would start the night with a question. Has anybody here wanted to do something so big, something that you felt was so out of your reach? Something, maybe a dream, maybe it was a business, maybe it was rowing across the Atlantic, or maybe not. <laughs> something that you could feel it in your body before you'd even done it. You, you were already there. Well, for me, I was 21 years old. I was living in Ireland, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where I was going, and a pamphlet landed on my lap, and it said, the ultimate test of the human spirit. And my mother's worst nightmare came true. <laughs> for me, I needed to know. So I rode in a 24-foot ocean rowing boat from Spain to the Caribbean. To give you an indication, the boat was probably the length of the stage and probably came from the screen right to about this point on the stage. And myself and my rowing partner, Paul Gleason, who's actually in the crowd here today. <laughs> we lived on this boat. We went through broken ribs. We went through a hurricane, two tropical storms. It'd be my luck that we were out there during the year of Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> we suffered dehydration, sleep deprivation. We even thought that we met a ghost at one point. <laughs> and we were part of an international race. I represented Canada, and at the time I became the youngest woman to successfully row across the Atlantic. And there was 26 uh, teams in the race, and less than half of them completed. Some of them were ripped in half in hurricanes. Some of them sunk. One boat was actually attacked by sharks, and this is <coughs> To date, my biggest fear, <laughs> and I have you know, there was even one boat that was picked up by modern day pirates off the west coast of Africa. <laughs> so what's the first logical thing that you do when you want to do anything is that you find somebody before you who's done it. So I was very lucky to have two tremendous mentors named Eamon and Peter Kavanagh. And the first thing they said to me is, Tori, this is going to be 90% mental. And to be honest, I was 21, and I didn't know how to row, so this was kind of a relief. <laughs> so for me, the mental journey started in the cabin. For us, for 86 days, this was my home. We had pictures of our family, my brother sitting in the audience here, there's a big picture of my brother. We had quotes, we had smells, <laughs> like eucalyptus and lavender were my favorite because we had to live here. The whole journey was based off of routine. Paul would row for two hours while I would sleep for two hours for 86 days. And we did that 24 hours a day to keep the boat moving. <laughs> so the cabin, the routine would start, you'd get a knock on the door. The first thing you'd do is you'd slowly peel your fingers one by one, your body constantly seizing, constantly in agony. You're rowing 12 hours a day. Then you put your wet chamois on. I just want everybody to know this is Paul's bum. <laughs> you put on your wet chamois. And imagine open sores. And imagine even just being in your own house and you can't get away from the wetness. You're wet in the cabin. You're, you're wet on the deck. Imagine coming home after a really rainy day in Vancouver. And all you want to do is take off a pair of wet jeans and you have to sit on your couch in them. That's what it was like for 86 days. So as we'd get ready to leave the cabin, the last thing I'd see is the difficult you do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. Now I had no idea that this would become so relevant. This really was the motto of our row and very much into my life. So as Paul and I would switch shifts, we created sort of an ultra-reality. This We made ourselves a little insane to stay sane. So as we'd swap shifts, I'd say, you know, how's your shift, Paul? And he'd go, yeah, it was good. I went to a rugby match with dad, and I had a few too many pints, and <laughs> mom got pretty upset. And I'd be like, high five, don't worry about it. She'll get over it. And by the next shift, she'd be fine. <laughs> so now I'm sitting in the middle of the Atlantic, completely by myself. This is the feeling of the boogeyman being under your bed when you're three years old. 
It's the kind of blackness that you can't even see the hand in front of you. Sometimes the sky, I felt that there was even holes in the sky because the stars were so bright. Now the ocean, on a regular basis I used to feel like she would taunt me. I, I very much humanized her to cope with her and the worst shift for me was between 2 to 4 a.m. because biologically your body just wants to sleep. And you'd hear the waves coming towards the boat and you'd be in anticipation waiting for them to slap the boat and it would be the sound of a bat hitting the side of the boat. Now to be able to cope with the ocean we created rules and these were really lifelines for survival is we had a rule that we would not throw away any garbage on the boat and we felt that if we respected the ocean she would respect us and she'd let us pass and we became extremely superstitious about this <laughs> so one day we're bailing water into our boat so at one point our desalinator broke down which is our water maker and we had to manually bail the water into the boat Paul's holding the bucket a wave hits the bucket he drops the bucket the bucket is now floating away from the boat we had another rule where we were never allowed to swim away from the boat and the reason why is the currents were so strong the boat was about a thousand pounds is you would never be able to turn the boat around to get your partner if your partner had drifted too far so you'd have to watch your partner die so we never swam away from the boat in this moment we're sitting there we're watching this bucket both Paul and I contemplated jumping in the water to get this bucket this is the scene out of Castaway when he loses Wilson <laughs> so we're sitting there and in this moment is pure defeat we both felt that we had no right to pass and at any time the ocean could take us pure vulnerability when you talk about vulnerability another really difficult day I was rowing and about a 50-foot wave curled over my six-foot cabin and came right at my face and it was the feeling of an animal jumping at my face I held the oars the, the boat went 90 degrees on its side the wave was powerful enough to bend my inch and a half stainless steel rowing brackets in half I hit the side of the boat and I broke my ribs so now I'm sitting in my cabin I think that there's there's no right or wrong choices in life but I think there's consequences to all choices and for for me I was sitting in the cabin and my logic was I can keep rowing or I can not row it's going to take me a long time to get there or I can keep rowing I'm going to be in a lot of pain but I'm going to get there quicker and written on our boat in the perspective of our rowing seat was pain is temporary quitting lasts forever and I held on to this and I got back on the seat I got back on the on the horse per se and this was an extra special day because my dad is probably the most computer illiterate person ever and my dad had a nightmare that I was drowning and is there any fathers to daughters in the room <laughs> maybe parents is maybe you can just appreciate the bond between child and parent my dad has this dream that I'm drowning and he can't reach me he worked in a closed mine in the Northwest Territories he got he was so upset about this he got on a caddy and he went 60 miles up to the headquarters and God knows what temperature and figured out how to text our satellite phone which we had never received a text and didn't know we could get texts <laughs> <laughs> and my dad texts me push through the pain face the fear you're a Viking to Valhalla and back for my first rowing shift I sat I had two hours to row and I was in so much pain that I just puke all over myself and I started to recite these words from my dad it almost became like a meditation and for until about 15 minutes all of a sudden I couldn't feel my body everything was numb and my body just knew the motion and I did this for 40 odd days I'd puke on myself for the first 15 minutes of every two hour shift and I really feel that my dad lent me his strength to get through this time I think that the biggest takeaway for me the biggest gift of the row is that I learned how to cope I learned how to take 
something that was so impossible, something that was so big, thinking that I had 30, 40 odd days to row in so much pain, that was overwhelming. So I would break it down into a week. And then sometimes a week was too long. I couldn't imagine doing another week. So I'd break it down into a day. And then I'd break it down into two hours. And often, all I could cope with was 15 minutes. And I think this is probably the number one thing that I've brought into my own life. And as I was on the bus on the way down here today, I was looking around and I was thinking, well, how do people cope? How do I cope sometimes? How, you know, I'm getting ready for a speech in interesting Vancouver, and I think, distract. Maybe you're at work, and maybe, you, maybe you're Facebook creeping when you should be working. <laughs> maybe you're writing emails to friends. Maybe you're texting. I'm looking on the bus, and everybody's on their phone. And when you're dealing with something, and I think just human nature is to distract, and I realize that's a luxury. And I didn't have that luxury on the row. So I had to go into my mind and I had to learn how to cope, how to make the impossible difficult. So that's just a little nugget of my story. So thank you guys very much for, for listening and being such a warm, lovely audience. Uh, shameless plug, as a couple of years ago, Paul and I had written a book together and you can get it anywhere across uh, Canada, chapters or hopefully any bookstore. And if you'd like to continue our, our journey with us, we welcome you. And I really look forward to all the wonderful speakers that are going to be up here tonight. So thank you very much.